forsaken and no Excuse me, excuses. Excuses. There we go. It's a nice song. Right, okay, if I can welcome you all to, to today's um, transport committee. Obviously, we've got the usual housekeeping announcements. Just to remind everyone, if you've got a mobile phone, I imagine most people have, if we can make sure that's turned to silent. Um, obviously, we've got the new microphone system, and can we make sure that people use it uh, accordingly? It is quite sensitive, so if we can make sure we sit at a suitable distance, not too close, not too uh, far away, and it will be picked up uh, accordingly for everyone's benefit. In terms of fire safety, there is no fire alarm test today, so if um, if there is an alarm sounding, we do need to treat it as live and listen to the very polite lady that will give us the instruction uh, to vacate the building. And the assembly point is just outside the Museum of Liverpool. That's Gordon's phone that's turned to silent. Um, and in terms of filming and photography, obviously we very much encourage anyone that wants to uh, film or photograph or record the proceedings. But we would always ask to speak to our democratic services team here at the front, purely on the basis of making sure none of the equipment that anyone brings with them interferes with the equipment that we're all using as part of the audio-visual stuff that we've got here ourselves. <clears throat> in terms of uh, Chair's uh, announcements, uh, I've just got to uh, make everyone uh, aware that, uh, unfortunately, Councillor Paul Pritchard from St Helens, who joined us back in, in June, uh, unfortunately has resigned from the, the Transport Committee, so uh, if we can place on our record, on record, our uh, deep heartfelt thanks to Paul for his efforts with us over the past few months. Okay, uh, first item of, of business is apologies for absence. Are you Charles, have we had any of those? Sorry, Chair, no apologies that I've been recorded. Okay, I think we've just got Jed Philbin um, yeah. missing from today's yeah. meetings. If we can record his absence, I think. Otherwise, I think we're all present and correct. Excellent. Okay, item number two is declarations of interest. So if there is anything anyone is aware of, please make us aware of it now, or at any time if anything does crop up during the proceedings of today's meeting. The third item is the minutes of the last meeting, and can I move that those minutes are a correct record of what happened back on the 10th of October? Is that agreed? Yes. Superb, I will be. Put my autograph on that accordingly. Um, I can borrow a pen. <laughs> okay. Moving on then, uh, the main aspect of today's meeting is we've got another one of our operator presentations, and we've actually got uh, Mr. Cameron Jones, who's the stakeholder mobilisation um, manager for the West Coast Partnership. Uh, and he's from First Group, and effectively this is the operator that will be taking on the West Coast mainline operation. So currently what is branded as Virgin Trends, uh, very shortly First Trend Italia will be taking on accordingly. So if we can thank uh, Mr Jones for being with us, and I'll hand over to you, and then once you've done the presentation we'll have some questions if that's okay. Over to you, thanks Cameron. Thank you Chair. Um, uh, so my name is Cameron, and um, as the chairman said, I'm here with uh, as a representative of the first group, uh, but also representing Trenitalia, our partners in this um, uh, franchise. Um, the, the relationship between the two companies is a 70-30 split in the partnership, which kind of reflects the operator status of first group and the uh, also operator, but really the high speed um, uh, credentials that Trenitalia are bringing to the partnership for the delivery of HS2. Um, I've got a presentation here today which is a much shorter version of the um, usual presentation. I wanted to uh, run through it uh, reasonably quickly to give time for questions. I think the quicker we get into your issues the better. Uh, so apologies if it seems a bit brief, um, uh, but we have got time to talk afterwards. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, let's get, let's get on. So. Liverpool up front and centre there, as you can see, so uh, I don't have any about the front page. Yeah. Right, so what is the West Coast Partnership? Well, the department has called it a partnership very specifically because they're looking for a company that's going to join them, join HS2, join Network Rail, and also work with external stakeholders and authorities 
on the delivery of what will be a transformative program on the west coast uh, with HS2 arriving. We're, um, uh, we're, going to, we're looking at the project as having three phases. The franchise will start on the 8th of December. Uh, that's the date that we'll start running the West Coast services. Um, and then, while we're doing that, we'll have a team working with HS2 and consulting with stakeholders on what is going to be the, the passenger requirement for high-speed services. I'll say more about that at the end, but right now HS2 is very much being focused on the engineering requirement with some look at what the passenger needs will be, station designs, that type of thing. And we're going to bring critical mass to that part of HS2 to start getting that then woven into the planning. And then uh, from 2026, we will we'll wait to see how, uh, how reliable that date is. But the, um, from 2026, we will be uh, running both um, companies. And the advantage there is that you'll have the same business running the West Coast services, designing high-speed services, so that the two organisations um, integrate uh, and this, the, the total service offered to customers is very specific for people who want to use high speed and people who want to use the new west coast after 2026. So it's an integrated approach. Uh, so there's um, uh, one of the big differences we hope you're going to see is the um, how collaborative this new business is. We're going to be appointing a partnership director for the first time. That will be a fully um, resourced director within the business reporting to the chief executive. And that partnership director will have the responsibility for running the program of external engagement and consultation with stakeholders, for running the relationships with authorities and governments. It's going to be uh, also going to be connecting up within the business the planning of the West Coast uh, and the planning of uh, high speed services so that we've got a fully integrated um, uh, business working externally with um, organisations that want to get their strategic planning considered in the planning process for high speed and west coast services. We'll have, um, we're calling them regional growth managers uh, right now, but these will be, uh, there'll be seven of these uh, people who will be the single point of contact for our stakeholders. There'll be, um, uh, there'll There'll be a, a person that you'll get to know. Uh, there'll be someone that uh, will save you looking at this edifice or this monolith that is the, the new West Coast Partnership and wondering who on earth do I go to to get my voice heard or get my views in or ask questions. There'll be a single point of contact accountable to you for the relationship with the business. And they will open up all the channels for you to um, get uh, to start negotiating and talking uh, to the company. There'll be a number of um, formal forums for doing this, we'll have uh, an economic development forum which will look at integrating the uh, business with big economic development plans for regions, so where plans are looking at having uh, better, more reliable, more frequent rail services to sustain their vision, we'll be integrating these plans with our own planning of services and timetable. The integrated transport forum is not really integrated transport, we're looking at that name. It's not about modal shift, but it's more about getting the, the long-term transport planning of uh, regions and authorities such as yourself aligned with, or us aligned with that. So we're making decisions that are uh, consistent with and aligned with your own long-term planning and your expectations for integrating rail with bus and tram and the other uh, uh, services that you have responsibility for. And then we'll have regional customer panels across the network, which are going to be there to get give the passengers a voice in their decisions about services, about the timetable, about ticketing and fares, all the things that the passengers are really concerned with. Um, and what you are seeing now quite often in franchises, there'll be a formal um, um, structured programme of um, external engagement, uh, annual conferences. Um, these are not just going to be talking shops, we'll be reporting on the outcome of these to the Secretary of State. The Department will expect to see that they have value and we're acting on um, initiatives and ideas discussed in these forums, so they're going to be a meaningful part of the business. Um, and then, we'll, uh, as I said, we'll have what we call, um, well I didn't say this, but the, the high speed element of the business is currently called the shadow operator. Um, they will be the conduit for discussions with you on the uh, planning of the high speed services and timetable and state, uh, train design, station design and fares and all those sorts. So uh, I'll say a bit more about that. 
So, I've, really, I've chunked down all the big plan, plans here into one slide. I don't want to avoid death by PowerPoint. Uh, I lost someone in the rest of this last week. It was quite upsetting. Um, we, uh, uh, so, what we're going to do, the first big investments we're going to make are in trains. We're going to take the whole Pindolino fleet and refurbish it to an as new uh, level um, of quality. Uh, that will require 20, all the standard class seats to be replaced, 25,000 seats. And that program of refurbishment and seat replacement will start from day one and be rolled out throughout the first few years of the, um, the business. We're going to take the voyagers off the network and we're going to replace them, those uh, 20 voyagers, with a fleet of 23 electric trains, 13 of which will be bi mode so that we can run on areas of the network where there's no electricity. Um, that's going to give us not just um, more capacity on the network, but significant improvements in terms of emissions and CO2 reduction. Um, we're going to uh, restore trust in fares, we say. Uh, we, we spoke a lot to passengers about fares. It's no surprise that they're still confused by fares. They're never sure if they're getting the, the right fare for their journey or the best fare for their journey. So we're going to work with Transport Focus, and we've made a commitment to um, redesign the fares that are offered by the West Coast Partnership. So not only will you be guaranteed the best fare for your journey, you'll understand what you're buying, the name of the fare will make sense to you. We're going to look at flexible fares for people that travel frequently, but maybe not five days a week. We'll look at, um, uh, we're going to look at um, better pricing for the peak off peak periods where there's some cliff edge <coughs> causing strange patterns of, of traveling. You get very, very busy trains and very empty trains, there's no, no one wins in that scenario. So we'll look at that sort of shoulder pricing flexibility. We'll, um, we're going to introduce automatic delay repay 15, uh, 15 minutes from day one, so if uh, you register as soon as you can, any journey that's delayed more than 15 minutes, you'll receive the refund straight back to your bank account, I think within 48 hours. Um, and with our Italian partners, we're going to introduce a system called Pico. Uh, this is where the technology um, goes beyond me a little bit, but this is a, a back office platform that will bring together all the channels that passengers use to buy fares through, whether it's through a window, through um, uh, online, on their phone. Um, it's going to bring all this together so that wherever you've bought your ticket or however you're holding your ticket, you'll be able to change it easily, you'll be able to talk to anyone about it. If you want to talk to someone on a phone, it doesn't matter what channel you bought it from. You'll go straight through to, to a customer service person who will help you straight away and answer your question. It's going to simplify ticket buying for passengers and it will also allow us to sell combined tickets on other um, uh, services, so combine a, a bus ticket with a train ticket or a tram, that type of thing. Um, the, uh, so let's move on to stations. Um, we're going to invest in new first class lounges in um, uh, Rugby Stockport Preston. Uh, we'll put, we'll modernise ticket offices in uh, Preston, Glasgow and Rugby. Um, I think you guys have some of the most modern ticket offices in the country, I think. And uh, we'll be looking at that format where you take the windows away and, and give staff direct, passengers direct access to staff, as long as staff are comfortable with the way that that's implemented. Um, we'll introduce uh, more room to park cars at the stations that we run. I think we run 16 of the stations on the whole network. And we'll make more space for parking bicycles. Um, we'll introduce spaces for charging electric vehicles as well. Um, we'll put up bus information screens to help people uh, understand the, uh, uh, the next leg of their journey, get information about the next leg of their journey. Um, uh, we'll also be funding CR, uh, community rail partnerships for the first time, which there's 19 of them across the network. They'll be getting funding from the West Coast franchise for the first time, and we'll be creating a fund uh, for them to bid into to, uh, for local station projects, for bringing uh, spaces back to life for other projects that they might, community projects they might want to, uh, uh, to uh, implement. For employees, right, we'll have an employee director in the business, um, nominated by the staff on the boards with uh, visibility of the board's discussions. Um, we're going to invest in about 50,000 training days for the staff. There's 3,500 staff, but I don't think the maths <coughs> work out directly because the training is split up into modules that are not just going to be customer service. They're also going to be, we'll focus on leadership, we'll focus on change management. These staff are going to 
competitive business through a, a lot of changes over the next um, over the period of the franchise. <coughs> which I should have said, sorry, it um, starts in December, I know I told you that, ends in 2031 with a, a discretionary three year extension if the Secretary of State believes it's, um, uh, uh, it could be um, granted. So we're going to um, uh, bring an end to any zero hour contracts and introduce a real living wage, and that's extended to our suppliers. So within year one, we won't have any suppliers that are, are using those tools in their business. Uh, so we'll use our uh, leverage to get um, those improvements done, spread as far as we can. <coughs> accessibility, we'll have an accessibility and inclusion manager. Uh, so uh, again, I think this is the first for the business. We're going to, uh, that person will oversee uh, training for frontline staff, particularly on how to work with passengers that have invisible disabilities who may not appear that they obviously need help, but they clearly do if you know the signs. Um, we're going to bring in uh, toilet changing for the facilities at some stations for people with uh, uh, changing needs, not just, not just baby changing needs, but for people with changing requirements. We're going to trial what we call the Passenger Assist app. It's already been trialled on one of our franchises, Southwest Rail. It's, um, we've heard a lot of horror stories about people being stranded on wheelchairs uh, on the network or in, is, have, with specific problems of mobility um, and basically being lost on the network and having to rely on passengers to carry them over steps, over bridges uh, and that's not good enough. Um, we, so there's a, an app being developed and trialled now which will not only bring more flexibility to people that have to book late or make changes to their journey if they've got these special requirements that, that will make it easier to do that but it will also mean that all frontline staff will know if someone's journey has been disrupted, where they are on the network and what they can do to give assistance to that person. So we, we won't lose people. Uh, I just think that that's, so, that's so important. <coughs> We're looking at something also called a digital chaperone, which um, this, this won't come until about the third year, but we'll try, uh, I believe it's something that will help people who just lack a bit of confidence about using the network, who just need someone on a phone or uh, someone who can just talk them through a station, talk them onto a service, help them understand a screen when they're at a station. So that's called the digital chaperone. And we're getting some interest in that from, uh, from the airports, for example. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll be telling you more about that as we start to try it. And the website that we launched will have Recite Me capability, which is if you're uh, if you're someone with um, uh, poor eyesight, you can adjust the contrast on the website. Uh, to make it suit your vision, or you can just increase the size, or you can even have passages of text read out to you if they're um, difficult to read. Um, sustainability. We will become the most sustainable option for intercity travel. I suppose you could walk between cities, that would be even more sustainable, but we're, um, uh, we're going to introduce a number of uh, measures to just improve the, um, the footprint of this business. We'll put water fountains at our stations, uh, we'll be giving people discounts if they bring their own cups for hot drinks, uh, the things that you're seeing at various um, uh, places now, we'll be introducing that. We've got a, a program that's going to reduce our, because of the trains primarily, reduce our CO2 emissions by getting rid of the voyages and improving the running under the electric wires, reduce our CO2 emissions by 61%. Um, and then what we call the non-traction energy, the, the, the energy that's used by depots, offices, different workplaces, will reduce that by 23%. And these are committed targets. We have to meet these. If we don't, the Secretary of State will be not just making us feel uncomfortable, we'll be asking for money. So these are very serious commitments. Um, we're also aiming to produce uh, to put zero waste into landfill uh, by the end of the franchise. And then I said a bit about it, but the, with HS2, we've got a, a partnership protocol that um, integrates our um, experts with the HS2 business as it exists now. We'll be working with them as one team. We'll be, a, we'll be a critical friend to the business. So if we think they're misunderstanding passenger requirements, we'll be telling them that quite <coughs> forcefully. But we'll also be coming to them with other solutions. We won't just be a blocker. So we'll be looking to talk to um, organisations like the city region, others around the country about what they want to see whether it's good connections to the high-speed network or actual high-speed services, what passengers require, and we'll be feeding that in now to the planning process. I know it's already started, but the company just needs that extra expertise on board, and we're bringing that. We've got around 500 experts 
in Trinitalia and first group across all the uh, disciplines of participants. <coughs> so, uh, moving on to, to Liverpool. So, what we want to do is to build a, a brand new relationship with the, um, uh, the city region. Um, we've already uh, got a memorandum of understanding, thank you, because we had talks um, during the bid process back in the uh, early 2018. Um, it won't surprise you here, because I think you're probably familiar with the subject, but the memorandum focused on a number of areas that you want to see improved. The first being um, the provision of services between uh, Liverpool and, um, uh, and London. Um, actually, I think I jumped a slide, which was our uh, timetable slide, by 2022, we'll be introducing 263 new services a week on the network. There's a big timetable change in 2022, and that's when the new trains will come on board, so we'll have more trains to provide more services. And as part of that, we'll be doing an extra <coughs> service per hour between London and Liverpool, and uh, so that'll be two services an hour, and one of those will be calling at Liverpool South Parkway, where we're in discussions with the airport on an MOU to improve the rail air links there. Um, where um, I know connectivity between Liverpool and other parts of the UK will be improved by this, but we can't be absolutely certain yet about the, the, um, the number of calls and the actual calls that we'll be making, but we'll be, um, be giving you information about those as we approach the, not 2022, but 2021, when we'll consult on the whole new timetable. But you are getting an extra two services um, per hour, uh, including on a Sunday in the peak periods, then it's difficult to say exactly what those what those hours will be because of engineering right now, but that's the plan. That's the plan. The, um, uh, we've been asked to look at uh, the restrictions uh, and pricing of peak and off-peak services. We'll do that. It's, it's not a good experience for passengers. It's not a good experience for us. We need to be more sophisticated about how we encourage people to use the train that's the best value and comes at the best time. Um, and will improve integration with other modes. So in addition to co collaborating with you on things like information screens and passenger information, this um, Trenitalia Pico system will help us to do more sophisticated ticketing that, is, uh, uh, that fits with your own ticketing uh, and we can offer joined up journeys. So there's a, a stream of work there that we believe we've got the, uh, the tools to improve. And what I should say about this quick presentation is this is just the starting point. We were given three months in 2018, uh, and we were given a lot of information, and we spoke to a lot of people, and we had to write a complete plan for the Business Act 2031. So we could really only do work with the information we had then. We're now going to, through the partnership director, through the different channels, be talking to you about how we can twist this, turn it, improve it. So this is just the starting point. As I say, we've also got a memorandum of understanding with the, um, the airport. Uh, John and an airport, we met them a few weeks ago and we're going to establish a, uh, a partnership agreement there focusing on things like, again, uh, uh, joint uh, ticketing, uh, more uh, helping passengers with baggage, travel information, or uh, joint marketing, all the things that, you, that would help, and also helping the airport to access other parts of the country that are a bit, uh, a bit difficult for them right now. Uh, and then uh, uh, we have... Uh, a letter, of uh, a letter of support from the University of Liverpool which sets out the plan for a, a, what we call a knowledge transfer partnership. So this is working with the, uh, the innovation uh, teams at the university on using their skills, our knowledge of the industry, bringing them together and working out new ways of approaching traditional problems, traditional challenges. Uh, so, and we'll be looking to We'll, we'll be funding that, so we'll be um, developing people at the university, but it'll be a joint relationship where we'll be finding solutions that help passengers, and we'll be rolling out those solutions. So, again, this is just the start of that relationship, and we'll be able to give you more information as that relationship is, uh, um, as that relationship matures. So, that's the email. If any of you have questions that you can talk about later that you can ask now, and that will, anything to that will be picked up by me or one of my colleagues and will be uh, responded to. Um, and that's it. Sorry, that was a really rapid run through, but uh, I expect you've got questions. Yes. Lovely. Thanks for that, Cameron. Um, I've got Ken, and I've got Gordon, and Nancy, and Pat, and the Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Colin. What's the presentation, Cameron? Excellent. I mean, 
Well, that was thought a rail company would speak to passengers and listen to what they say, you know. <coughs> and also, it sounds like what we've wanted for years, an integrated transport system. I mean, trains and buses speak to one another, you know, innovative, but, you know, let's hope it works. Uh, you did allude to it uh, once or twice in your presentation, Cameron, and as you know, Mersey Travel has the largest active smart ticketing area anywhere outside London. What are the franchise commitments <coughs> and your plans in respect of the development of smart ticketing solutions? Will you be prepared to work with us on smart ticketing? For example, we'll be able to use a local smart saveaway ticket on your trains between Lime Street and Runcorn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, yes, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're getting used to talking to passengers now, so we'll do our best to do it even better. Um, right, we'll, um, we've got quite a smart ticketing programme. Um, I should say at the outset, if I don't give full details now, we will come back to you with specifics. Um, we won't do anything at the start that's going to disrupt current plans and current ticketing, and every innovation that we plan, including the introduction of the, the PICO system, which will help us, will be done in sympathy with that, because we don't want to lose those gains. Uh, so that's our plan right now, to make sure that where it's operating, you have the biggest, there's others in, in Scotland that we have to um, integrate with as well. So we will be carrying forward improvements, but in a way that captures the best of what's happening now. And I'll give you more details on maybe uh, times, uh, dates that we're planning to start, uh, and how we're proposing to um, consult on that. Gordon and Nancy then path then out, and if I see a few more hands, I'll just take them down until I've noted them to Gordon. Thank you very much. Um, the new rolling stock that you're getting, you may well be uh, familiar with some of the aspects of the new rolling stock that we're getting on um, many side. Particularly uh, putting measures for people with disabilities, such as the sliding step. What, uh, what advances in that new rolling stock would you make in terms of accessibility? And if I could ask another question, Chair, just to then reward a little bit. It's on your side improving the journey experience. Uh, you talk about you'll restore trust in the fares. I asked the same question to, uh, to, to, to London North West about the disparity between the uh, advanced purchase fares and the walk on fares. I we could probably get to New York and cheaper than some of the fares that we see advertised. So, how, how would you propose to balance that out Thank you. Right, on accessibility, uh, we'll be, I think next week, if not next week, very, very soon, announcing the, um, uh, the contract for the uh, delivery of new trains, for the building of the new trains. So we'll have more details on that now. I've, I have been asked this question, and I've been uh, told that, of course, we'll be compliant with the standards, no question of that. But we're going to seek to go beyond them uh, everywhere we can that makes sense on, 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 on the fleet. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll have more details for, for you on that. Yeah. Perhaps you could uh, let us know that, uh, that later on sometime later to chair what those particular measures would be. And we haven't seen our great trains that are coming into operation to slide and we should really have a little look at it to lead it. And I think in fairness, just to follow on, we'd be more than happy to share any of our learning with that, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, that would be helpful. I think if there's an exemplar, we have to we have to look at it. And this is what part of the new plan is for the business. We're going to be sharing both ways. So thank you for that invitation. I'll get through to, uh, to the team. Um, fairs. Uh, right, so there are we are going to try and uh, make fairs uh, more affordable. Um, the uh, Currently, the... Uh, the pricing of a, an advanced um, one-way single is uh, round about the same price as a return. Uh, we're going to make a commitment to that being no more than 70% of the return. So it's an effective fare reduction. Um, it's, going to, it's the right thing to do for passengers. Um, it's, uh, uh, we quite, quite how quickly we'll do that, I don't know, but that's a, that's a quick adjustment. I don't think that's going to be like a year two or three uh, commitment, so I can get you some more information on that. We're going to make uh, upgrades more affordable. Uh, the, um, uh, the question about, um, what was it, advanced purchase? Yes. Yeah. I, I asked the same question with uh, the Northwest, and, and, and 
it just seems to be as if you don't want to sell tickets too cheap on advance and lose customers that pay more. But sometimes it seems to be that imbalance where you think that people put off completely using a train journey. You look at you know a price and you think, I'm not buying a train company, I only want to make a journey. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I use trains as well, so I feel the <laughs> So, uh, yeah, well, we'll um, uh, I don't think we'll be um, trying to uh, push people towards walk up fares at all. We won't do that. We'll be keeping the advanced purchase open. Um, and the website will be will make that easy to, uh, easy to do. So, uh, but I'll let you know more about our end of the balance there. Nancy? <coughs> schemes now, um, whether we've got a plan for any other enhancement, so I'll find out. Um, uh, I don't remember reading about that in the <coughs> synopsis, but, um, so I'm not going to say yes, but I'll look at that um, for you, yes, there may be something hidden there in the fares basket. Okay, I've got to Pat next. Uh, thanks Chair, two brief questions if I may. Uh, you mentioned and combine ticketing at the airport or you know hookups at the airport to you know rail air stuff. I was just wondering, you know, there's a lot more people choosing to just not fly and just take the train. I was just wondering about any initiatives to facilitate people who want to, you know, go from Liverpool to Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, etc. Are you kind of looking at that in terms of how would that work? Um, and second, you briefly mentioned investments in cycle parking stations. Are they going to be kind of secure cycle storage like we have on the Mersey Rail network where you actually blow off of your bike in a contained shelter rather than just locking the bike to a bike stand? Uh, right, well we're working with the, the tourist authorities in the UK, first of all, because we want to, there's a lot of uh, leisure traffic on this uh, franchise and there's, there's, there's enormous scope for more. Is then better, there's more services. We're going to put additional services on, onto Landudno, for example. It's a, it's a huge tourist down, uh, market there. Uh, and we'll be looking at just at spreading that across the UK. And um, I'll talk to the marketing team about whether they're looking at how you uh, how we market um, easy journeys to the continent uh, and, and, and let you know about that. But the, the plans I've seen so far are focused on the UK market. The yeah, secure cycling, uh, I haven't seen the plan. Uh, I know we're going to introduce secure cycling, so uh, I'd love to say to you it's going to be like the, um, uh, the reverse travels uh, parking, because uh, it's, it's just, again, that's an exemplar. Um, but uh, I can't tell you it will be right now, but I'll find out. Okay, next I've got Alan, then followed by Steve, then John Stockton, John Wiseman, Helen, and Chris. And I've got a few more, so I'm going to go down and Alan. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you for that. Uh, in a previous uh, life, I travelled to Liverpool, to London, from Cornwall, London, quite a lot. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is on board, on board catering. Would you like to say something about what you're going to do on board catering? And I have one more question after. Yes, the, uh, we do have uh, plans where we talk to the high street retailer now to um, start to enhance the onboard catering. Um, so there will be a new offer, uh, new products from a, a high street brand that we'll recognise. Um, we're going to um, uh, also showcase local products up and down the network. So we'll work with uh, local suppliers and SMEs who have got um, products they might want to uh, showcase on the services. So we'll be using that as a, a platform for them. We'll be keeping the cafes on board, uh, and there'll still be the at-seat service that you're familiar with, so uh, but a new range of, of products. Right, thank you. If I may, thank you. Uh, if you have mentioned early on in your little presentation about rebate for late trains, you said a, 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 a quarter of an hour. Does that mean a full refund after a quarter of an hour late, or whatever? Bearing in mind that this is an Italian company, 
and Mussolini made the train go on time. <laughs> yes, so, uh, yeah, so that's, what, that's what we didn't consult with when we were around the I'm sorry to uh, be disappointed. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, um, it, it won't be a full refund, it will be a percentage of the fare. Um, we're, the passenger charter will be published on the day that we start. It may even be published soon, I'm not entirely sure, but that will give the, the full. Um, so that's, if we delay 15 minutes, you'll get a percentage and that will... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, if you're three or four hours late, you know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're probably going to be Thank you. Steve, uh, without quoting fascistic dictators, I'll make my point. Chester is a key part of, of our network, and more so as a will councillor, many of our residents use Chester as their gateway to the rest of the country and so on. So we mentioned a lot about Lime Street and, and, and the Liverpool services. Uh, what are your plans for services at Chester on the franchise? Right, I'll have to come back to you on the specifics about Chester, but yes, we'll do that this week. Yeah. Sorry, I can't give you the answer now. Okay, John Stutton, then John White. Maybe I could, sorry, I could just add that um, the, the big timetable, we, we've had to excuse, accept the timetable that's there now, we had to write the bid based on that timetable. And there was very little opportunity to flex that. We, we were able to do something for Landugno, we might be able to do something for Preston, but very, very small changes at right now. The, the big opportunity is in 2022 when there's a national timetable change, we'll have new trains, more trains, um, and then we'll be consulting on the design of that timetable. So that would be the moment where we are able to talk specifically about the importance of that link to the passenger people in Chester what we can do to help them access other parts of the network. But um, yeah, so I don't think there's any plans, particularly right now, to enhance Chester services. It'll be in 2022. Consulting in 2021. Yeah, there'll be no detriment in the interim. Oh no, no, I, should, no, I can give you, I can give anyone a reassurance on that. You'll see no detriment in frequency or speeds from the start. Excellent. John. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Cameron, for your presentation. Excellent. Uh, I've got two or three questions, if I may, please. You might take them individually. The journey times from Liverpool to London services are currently 2 hours 12 minutes. That reduces to around 1 hour 30 on, <coughs> excuse me, under HS2 proposals. But that still seems journey speeds at 58 miles an hour from crew. There have been considerations to how, has there been any consideration to how journey times could be improved ahead of the introduction of HS2 services that could support Liverpool visitor and business department? <coughs> oh, excuse me, Chester. trains are going to have 125 mile an hour capability. Of course it relies on the, the line being able to uh, take a higher speed. Um, we're, um, they'll have faster acceleration, better braking, so that, that reduces journey time as well. Um, we'll also be talking to Network Rail, I believe, I won't say this commit to this, but I think we'll talk to Network Rail about maybe some um, track uh, speed improvements, line speed improvements. Well, I'll have to come back to you on that. But uh, what we're doing between now and HS2 to improve journey time. Is your question again? Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you, thanks very much. Well, the second question is uh, it's a similar to Council Focus' question earlier. Uh, Runcorn is a West Coast managed station and obviously the centre of the known universe. So, <laughs> what, what plans do you have for Runcorn, by any chance? But you're going to say I'll have to go back to you. <laughs> <laughs> on the station specifics. Um, yeah, I mean, we already knew it was the centre of the known universe, um, uh, but there was a lot of people vying for that title. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I'll get, I'll get back to you about specifics on, on run call. I mean, the, have you got an active community rail partnership? Yeah. Sorry, do, do you have an active community rail partnership? No, as far as I'm aware, no. No? Okay, no. Because we, <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are uh, significantly enhancing the, the, the support for community rail and a lot of things that happen around <laughs> rail stations that make them a better environment uh, come from that. I mean, we'll be putting in new ticket machines, for example, but I don't think that would really light your uh, candle particularly. But, but they'll, they'll be simpler and easier for passengers to use. We'll, um, they'll be wheelchair-friendly, that type of thing. So uh, the, the water fountains, but actual the services and that, I think what we're going to see is what's there now. Um, you'll see newer pendolinos coming through, and um, refurbished pendolinos coming through. 
your uh, constituents will have a better journey experience, I hope, before HS2. The third and final question for me, please, Jack. Um, you, you alluded to this in your presentation. Just in terms of your carbon reduction strategy, I'm just wondering what sort of speed of travel are we there? Because in view of the fact in 10, 15 years' time, we'll all be going for a swim if we don't get this right. Uh, we really do need to address this issue as a huge, urgent issue. It's an existential crisis we're heading towards. So I'm just wondering what your immediate plans are to try and reduce those as quickly as possible, please. Thank you. Well, I think the, um, the, the fastest reduction will come about when we get the new trains online, which will start arriving from uh, 2020, early 2022 through to the complete fleet. So the voyages will be coming off and new trains coming on. So you'll see the, the, the biggest savings in carbon in that period. At the depots, we've got a program over the, uh, uh, not sure how many years, but we're going to be putting in rainwater harvesting, solar panels. We're going to be introducing all, all sorts of uh, measures to reduce the impact of the uh, stations on the, uh, on the environment. Um, I could probably get the, the sustainability plan will be published and it will give a, you'll see a, a delivery schedule. So um, I'll make sure that the committee sees that when it's done. of service disruption on engineering works, the diversionary routes to Liverpool via Warrington, Earlstown and the electrified channels. The best way to retain, retain train crew competency is to have at least one service up and down on either route. Will you be looking to do this and if so, would you consider calling at one of the stations in St. Helens, such as St. Helens Junction, using a slightly different door opening, owing to its large car park? Okay, well, both of us were right. That was in depth, and I am going to come back to it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds like a win-win. If, it, if it's something that uh, it keeps our drive knowledge up for those moments, and it's going, we can use it to uh, to access the, the station, then um, yeah, but if that's going to be in the minutes, I'll, I'll come back to it. That's a very specific issue. Brilliant. Okay, I've got Helen, Chris, Natalie, Harry, and Francis. Does anyone else if you want to indicate as well, whilst uh, uh, Helen's asking? That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if you're going to be running more services to Liverpool, can we expect to see um, more jobs with your company in the area? Well, we, uh, the, uh, there'll be no loss of jobs. The, uh, the, uh, the jobs plan that I've seen focuses on apprenticeships. We're going to increase the number of apprenticeships that the company is. Um, uh, funding and, and um, bringing to the business. So I think that's going to be where the, the job creation will come. The more services, yeah, that's a, it's a, a fair point. 263 more services across the network, more trains, uh, would imply a, an increase in staff. For the area, I'd have to come back to you again after, I'm very sorry, how that breaks down for Liverpool. I mean, these, these trains, well, there'll be more of our staff coming in now, Liverpool on the trains, but it means quite for the station staff, for example. Um, to find out whether we're using the existing complement or whether we're going to be increasing staff numbers. And whether there'd be apprenticeships available in Yes, the yeah. We, uh, uh, my understanding is those apprenticeships are going to be along the, along the route, so they are going to be, uh, the, the port hubs along the route will be focusing on apprenticeships there. Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, two quick questions. One is uh, related to the staffing issues. Um, obviously, we've got a, there's a large number of staff currently engaged in providing the uh, West Coast services. Uh, uh, so it's really just.